Okay, we're, we're going to be going live in a moment. Hold on. All right. All right. Okay, so Frank, this is now going to be public. One second. I didn't hear. Okay. I'm just going to give this a title. Okay, one second. Okay. One moment. Okay, we're going live. Okay, uh, I, I wanna thank you, uh, <clears throat> Frank, Frank Horn for joining me um, on this live streaming and, and Zoom meeting uh, where I wanted to discuss with you um, how you see the uh, social bill of rights that I'm advocating uh, affecting life in, in rural America. Uh, and uh, to shed light on that based upon your own experiences as someone who spent much of your life farming. And uh, let, me, let me turn the discussion to you to begin with. And um, if, if you can maybe describe what you see really as, as the big problems facing people in, uh, in rural America uh, that you've been facing um, as someone who has done farming? Well, number one, number one is healthcare. Yeah. Uh, uh, achieving healthcare um, with insurance. The, the only way we were able to farm is that my wife taught school and we had health insurance through her job. Yeah. Um, that, that was fine until she became disabled and lost her job. And then, and then it got dicey there for a while. And then eventually uh, she is on with the uh, Medicare and yeah. I'm on with the VA. So that was, that was the number one thing. Well, before uh, the there second was... thing yeah. is that, uh, no, no. We. The second thing is is earning a living. We we grew chickens under under contract with with the chicken company, as all chicken growers do, and uh, the chicken companies are regional monopolies, and they are uh, extremely exploitive. Yeah. Uh, it took, it took me 20 years, but basically I went broke and we lost everything. Uh, we had no recourse to, to no, uh, I guess, intervening authority to, to, to act on our behalf uh, during that. It was just a long, slow decline. Uh, even we held up our end, but the chicken company didn't hold up theirs on, on two big issues. One was pay. The last 15 years that I grew the 
you know, growing with. Uh, I got 10 and a half percent in gross pay raises. The inflation rate for those 15 years was 43 percent. It was a death of a thousand cuts. Yeah. We just went into a long, a long, slow decline. Uh, the second point, which is more a minor one, but but it, it well, it was cost us plenty of money, is that we were supposed to have tech service as part of the agreement with the chicken service. I had a disease problem in my houses for five years. I know what it was. It was, uh, we had a different strain of coccidia in our houses than they were vaccinated for. And the only thing they did in five years basically was to threaten me if I didn't make it better threatened to cut me off, which they eventually did. Uh, the, uh, their lack of pay ruined us really right before that. So it was kind of moot. But there was no, no protection yeah. from the chicken company. Yeah. None, none under law. Now I know that um... Uh, I tried to work with different growers associations, yeah. but but that that was useless. Why, why were the uh, yeah. growers associations so powerless? Because the individual growers had no power yeah. to to congregate. I mean they. They are all in thrall of the chicken company and of their banks. They, there was no alternative to do anything else. You know, there's there's this yeah. image of uh, of rural America where one thinks of the small, or some people imagine that the small farmer is uh, basically the main player and. Uh, has some way of being viable, but it seems like, would you say that in, in terms of chicken growing no. and many other kinds of agricultural products, you're really a contractor for a monopoly. And as a contractor, you don't have any labor yes, rights. That's, that's, you, don't have, you don't have any benefits. You're not protected no. by any labor laws. You're on your own, as you say, against this huge monopoly. Yes, that's it exactly. And they are not trustworthy to my experience. They 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 are not interested in, in your success. Yeah. In fact, you get the distinct feeling that uh, one of the greatest fears of a chicken company is that somebody working for them is gonna make money. Yeah. Yeah. Which is uh quite opposite. That it should be. If they were truly viable and successful, then yeah. people working for them would be successful as well. Now, for uh, chicken operators yeah. like yourself, would you have um, a significant number of employees, or would would you basically no, run the operation on your own? Well, I ran it on. On my own for three years, we had a at the time was a large farm, yeah. chicken farm. Uh, and I ran it on my with some weekend help from teenagers for three years, and then I got my nephew in to help us full time. Yeah, and it was me and him for eight years, I think, till he left. Yeah, and then I got another helper to to help me and. He stayed until I had to pull the plug in 2012. Yeah. And uh, it, it's, yeah, no, no, it's not a labor and intensive industry on that yeah. scale. Yeah. It's, it's automated to yeah. a lot. I mean, I think that's, that's true of most agriculture. You know, now I've read that. Only 1.7% yeah. of the of wage earners in America 
support themselves in agriculture because it's become so mechanized, as you're saying, which would make you think it's very productive. Yes, it is. Make it, it seem is. that you could have a decent living, but um, I guess that's not well, the case. It, by, by, it by the way, your video is going off, so I'm making a request that you turn it on. I don't know if you're able to do that, um, but we'll do what we can do. Yeah, I said it's a blue bar to find. Okay. Let's try that again. There it goes. I think you're coming back. Okay. It says because I know in, in many my video. I mean in many fields of work, oh. the big businesses are are using the uh, the technique of treating the, the people they, they use to provide them with their products as co independent contractors who are not protected by any labor laws, who don't have any pensions provided through the work. Don't have any health care provided through it. Any benefits are like that. So you're really on your own in, a, in America, where you know we don't guarantee health care to everyone, or we, and we don't guarantee decent pensions to everyone, as other countries have done. That's true, and and my 20 years of chicken growing was a financial disaster. I mean, we lost everything, and and you weren't putting away uh, any kind of pension. And along this either. No. So it no, sounds like I, was, yeah. I had an IR at first. At, yeah. at first I, I was enough to put a small amount, a modest amount in an IRA, but yeah. that disappeared over time. No longer had the funds to do that with. Yeah. So we, we wound up with pretty pretty small IRAs out of it yeah. out of twenty years. Yeah. Not, nothing sufficient to provide you with a decent income after you retire. No, not close, not close. Yeah, yeah. And, and selling, selling the farm and the houses was a loss. Yeah. Uh, I, I was not able to retire on, I wasn't even able to pay off all my debt on what I got for the farm when we yeah. sold it. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it's just corporate America pretty much let us dry. Now I take I mean, it as, we, I, I, as yeah, you're saying uh, it, that, you know, your story is not unique. Many of the other chicken farmers either ended up in the same predicament or they're going through it right now. Yeah, we lasted in, uh, uh, longer than average. When yeah. I was looking into these things, uh, the average Chicken farm lasted seven or eight years. In Georgia, they lasted longer than that. They lasted on average 11 and a half years. 11 and a half years. We ago. lasted, yeah. And that's what, what, we lasted 20 years, but that's that's what a million dollar investment. Really? That, uh, that we were paying. Yeah. So after, so if on like average, said, it was, if on average a Georgia chicken farmer is in business for 11 years. What what do they end up after those 11 years? What 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 situation are they in? Are they basically broke? From my experience, yeah. as far as I know, uh, uh, broke or divorced, which yeah. I guess is the same thing. Uh, it's, I mean, I know people who who struggled along. For, for their entire careers, but they, yeah. they were running cattle and other, yeah. had other sorts. I, I guess I that's, yeah, and that's probably somewhat similar. They have to deal with meatpacking companies. Uh, yeah. I, or big well, dairy companies. That, they're, well, actually, uh, the large meat packing companies were trying to put cattle on a contract basis at one time back in the 2000s. I don't know if, so they could control the price of cows in the market. They wouldn't need, oh, say 20% of the yeah. cattle, in the, if that, under contract. Yeah. 
order to manipulate the price. That's about all I know about cattle. Yeah. Uh, well, I do we know didn't that have chicken, enough land. Yeah. I mean, I do know that chicken consumption, cattle. chicken consumption per capita in America has been rising rapidly, partly out of health concerns. Oh yeah, yeah. And so you'd think that it yeah. would be a field where chicken producers might be able to have a decent livelihood, given that demand is up. Well, no, the chicken corporation, the owning class of the chicken corporation is doing very well. Yeah. Uh, every, their employees and, and their growers do not yeah. do well. Uh, it's, it's just a monopolistic exploit. We, yeah. we uh, really need to recharge our antitrust laws and enforce them. Uh, because the, because monopolies or oligopolies yeah. are yeah. sucking the lifeblood out, out of Americans. Yeah. I mean, I can see you know on, on the social bill of rights that I'm 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 sort of presenting in this campaign. Uh, you know, to fulfill the basic human right to health care, uh, you know, I'm I'm proposing a separating health insurance from employment so that you get it automatically, no matter who yes. you're working for, whether you lose your job or anything like well, that. And, it, and it's just provided for as most other countries do it. And, exactly. Uh, uh, tying health insurance to a job is really pretty stupid yeah. because health needs are last a lifetime. Jobs don't. So you need to unconnect it from, from employment, yeah. from jobs. And, and that's even it good for the employer. To the population. I mean, even yes. the employers save yes, from it. We're, it they would make it yeah, yeah it, it would make us a more competitive society if, yeah. if it were decoupled from employment. And of course, they'd have, uh, it'd be easier for them to pay you better a better cut in of the oh, production. Oh, that won't happen. Yeah. They, they, would, they would rather die. To, yeah. I mean, the chicken company management is rude, crude, and unschooled. Yeah. They, they, have, they have nothing but contempt yeah. for, uh, for, for the suckers they got working for them. Uh, now, if you were, now, no, now they I, will not pay yeah. you. But they, no, it would only, yeah. I know it would only be through legislation that that yeah. they would pay yeah. more. Only if they're by the force of law would yeah. they pay. Well, I mean, I, you know, I do think we, at least when you think about employees, you know, we do need to have a fair minimum wage, not the seven twenty-five. I think it should be over twenty dollars an hour. Um, I think there should oh. be unionization of all employees. Yes. I think employees should have seats on corporate boards. Now, I'm wondering if that, those kind of measures could be translated into your situation or the situation of, of contract farmers where they could have a really strong organization of their own, like a union, and also have seats on the corporate boards of the monopolies. So you'd have 50% of the seats on their corporate board, conceivably, and then they might be treating you very differently. Yes, you'd have a say. You you would no longer be, I mean, beneath contempt. Yeah. You you would you would have a say in what was going on. You would have some some countervailing power. Yeah. Which is which you don't have now at all. I mean, you spoke of law, and I guess the, the law, you would like to see legislation that would ensure that you would get a decent cut or percentage of, uh, I guess, the value of what you're producing. And uh, yes, do you, do you, yes, and that's the only way yeah. I would have gotten it. And I assume there are no such laws. Yeah, 
No, no, this is America. Yeah. I mean, no, there are no such law. The fact is, such protection as um, we gained through the New Deal have been uh, pretty much gutted over the last 40 years. Yeah. Uh, By the way, I'm asking you to start your video there's again. There's less law you're now not. than there has. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I hear back, back when I was in college, I, I spent several summers working. Uh, in Louisiana, around Franklin, Louisiana, with some people, including H.L. Uh, Mitchell, who was a founder of the Southern Tenants Farmers Union. He was trying to organize sugarcane workers mm. on these big sugarcane plantations. Yeah. Where, where the workers were all African-American, lived in these wooden shacks owned by the company. They bought everything they consumed in a company store. And the government was giving them subsidies uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's true also of, of the chicken um, processors, but they would have a hearing every year because in order to get the subsidies, the companies had to show that they were treating their employees decently. Now that doesn't mean that uh, at these hearings, people got a fair shake, but there was some kind of procedure that was there, and usually the sugarcane workers never really went to those meetings or had anyone really representing them. Uh, I don't know if there's anything similar in the chicken industry. Well, out of field? No. No, no there, there's, there's not, that I know of. Yeah. There's a, no, you're strictly on your own. Yeah. And, and you're, and you're, you're, you're arrayed against, you know, billion dollar industries. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you have no say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they aren't even polite about it. I mean, it's, uh, and uh, it, it's, it, it's led to a, a, a decline in standard of living. Yeah. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, my father came from abject poverty. Uh, and my mother was not quite as bad, but he, when we were growing up, he worked, he, he had a technical job and he, he went to work every day and things got better over time. Yeah. We, we, we did better. Yeah. Well, that ended about the time I labor market in the early seventies. Yeah. Uh, um, Wages were decoupled from productivity. Yeah. And over the last 40 years that I, I was trying to make a living, yeah. uh, things just basically got worse yeah. over four years. Yeah. And uh, that, that's been my experience. It just, it's just no matter how, how hard you work, no matter how diligent you are, no matter how how well you improve yourself, it, it gets worse. No matter your investment, no matter your your education, it's it's for naught. Yeah. That's that's been my experience. Yeah. Well, I know that you know the facts you cite, you know, hold true throughout the entire labor market. You know, wages have stagnated since the 70s. The economy's more than doubled, all that wealth has gone to the top. And uh, if you're a single parent, if you're a single parent, that means for most people, your family is condemned to poverty because one wage is no longer enough to well, support yourself or a family. Well, even if you aren't, even if you aren't, most, yeah. if you're basically working people, yeah. uh, you're, you're pretty much impoverished, especially if you have health issues. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you, and of course, health just, insurance plans are, are often too expensive to use because you've got copays and deductibles. Yeah, and of course, the premiums. Exactly. And that applies to even to social security, as you know. Exactly. It doesn't cover everything. It has copays, deductibles. Yeah. It's not what it should be. Yeah. Yeah, you can still go bankrupt on Medicare. Yeah. 
I mean, Medicare is not an end all be all. You can, yeah. it, it, there's definitely room for improvement yeah. because for the simple reason you can go bankrupt on Medicare. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm proposing Medicare for all now. I, I sometimes call it super Medicare for all because Medicare, you know, is not sufficient. It doesn't cover everything, but we need something that covers all our health needs, you know, physical, mental, dental, long-term care, and it and it shouldn't have copays, deductibles, or even premiums. Yeah. And I think it should all be paid for by putting the burden on those yes, I, I, who have the most wealth, the top 10%, and particularly the top 1%. Yeah. Yes, exactly. The money's there. Why not use it to, to help the population? I mean, I know when I went out campaigning um, last time I ran for office two years ago in the 10th district, right? I didn't have the pandemic sort of shutting down person to person activities. You know, I went out to many of the 25 counties, most of which are rural. And I think it's common in, in many of these places that the population has stagnated, it's even declined since the 1920s. And you go to the towns and they're yeah, really decimated. Yeah, the, Half the stores, three quarters of the stores are boarded up. Uh, agricultural employment has shrunk and is not very viable. Yes. And there's, there's very little other options for employment. Uh, you see a kind of proliferation of prisons actually as, one, as often the only employer in many of these towns but uh, not necessarily a place you want to work. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, these towns are, I think this whole rural no. landscape is in, is in pretty sad shape. Um, yeah, it is because, uh, well, well, for the same reason as, as the large urban areas are, are in decline, there, there's, there, there's, I guess, I guess you'd say surplus labor. Yeah. For for one exactly. thing, they, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's it's really sad. I mean, I support, as you know, and I know, and I, I believe you also support the idea of having thinking of work as something that is a right that should be guaranteed by the government when the market fails to provide employment to people and that government should step in and provide yeah. people with work. And that, that also includes in rural areas. Uh, whereas we know young people yeah. have to leave because there's just not enough work and, uh, or, and certainly not enough decently paid work. Uh, and I can, I, how, do, how do you see that being applied? A policy of full employment? Well, I think it would be a, a a very good thing. Uh, uh, people want to be occupied. Uh, my experience is that most people want to work. They they want to do well. Uh, most of them in in today's society don't have the opportunity. Uh, I certainly. Uh, Yeah, I mean, and, and it's, it's obvious that corporate America is not going to, to step up to it. Yeah. So people through their government, through people's government, has to look after themselves. So I'm, I'm very much for government intervention because corporate intervention pretty much failed us miserably. Yeah. Like, what, what, what do you see? I mean, if, if you think of the places you've lived, what kind of things could you see the government putting people to work doing? Infrastructure, for one, just road work, uh, just infrastructure, uh, drain cable, uh, or broadband. Uh, yeah. That's uh, one glaring need is is, uh, is government intervention and because corporate America is not going to strain cable to rural America. 
for broadband. Yeah. There's yeah. just not enough yeah. customers or and or customers who can afford it. Yeah. Uh, It makes me think also of the post office, the same thing. You know, you can't expect the post office to be completely profitable. You know, it's providing a public no, service. And yeah, it's not supposed to be in. Um, yeah. It's, and it's necessary now more than ever in a pandemic. Where you can't even have yes, your yes, exercise of franchise no, safely unless you can mail in your ballot. Yeah, that's very true. It's uh, again, that's where attempts to privatize the post office have failed miserably. Yeah. And the people need to take care of their business through the government. No, I mean, I, I can't think of any industry that frankly will be more endangered by global warming than agriculture. And uh, I don't know how you're, you feel about having a Green New Deal and uh, what it could do for life in the rural areas and uh, especially if well, you attach it to a federal um, job guarantee where no one will lose their job. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can see a lot of value in getting away from a, from fossil fuels and to renewable yeah. energy sources. Uh, that's just makes sense. Uh, oil is a dirty stuff. I mean, that's, yeah. I, I think that uh, renewable sources will be the fuel of the 21st century. I mean, coal was the fuel of the 19th century and oil pretty much of that of the 20th century. And I, I think renewable sources yeah. are, are going to be the fuel of the 21st century. And I think we should, yeah. should invest in it. Yeah. yeah. And of course, a federal job guarantee could put people to work, you know, bringing clean energy everywhere, yeah. in, including yeah. rural areas. And certainly a lot, a lot of application for solar, wind, and uh, other types, including biofuels. I, I, I would suspect that biofuel production could be a great boon to agriculture if it's handled properly. Well, it, it, I, I don't know because when the cost of oil goes down, yeah. the bottom falls out the biofuel. Yeah. Uh, that, that might be a trickier one. Yeah. Well, it might require yeah. simply telling the, the fossil fuel industry, you've got until 2030 to end production and, and make a conversion. You certainly have an immense amount of wealth that you can use to do that. And then biofuels would be in a different situation. Now you, you mentioned that you had- uh, yeah, That's true. Yeah. yeah. You, you mentioned that uh, you had had experience dealing with uh, veterans hospitals and the like. You were, you were a veteran yourself? Yes. Back. And you were, I don't know if you, are you the generation uh, of Vietnam? Yes, I, I, I am technically a Vietnam War era veteran yeah. because I enlisted right into that. Uh, well, how did, how did you feel that you were treated when you came back in terms of what opportunities you were provided by our country? And since then, in terms of how the Veterans Administration oh. has been in dealing with you? Well, well, one of the reasons I enlisted was for the GI Bill so I could go to school. Yeah. That was, that was a great thing. Yeah. Uh, and my father got what he had through the GI Bill. Yeah. Uh, and that's, 
where I picked up on that and uh, thought it was a, a good thing. Uh, plus, when uh, when our private insurance ran out and, and I was eligible for VA uh, through my disability, uh, it, it was a lifesaver. Yeah. The VA medical system has been a lifesaver for me. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm very grateful for it, and I'm really very much against privatizing it, yeah. uh, and unless it's made, I guess, made moot by universal health care, yeah. if, if we had truly had high quality universal health care, I'd it might the need for the VA might decline, but yeah. uh, I mean I, I can don't see, see it, that happening anytime soon. I mean I could see it still having a role, even if we had uh, a, a good Medicare for all, because it has specialized services to provide to veterans, and you know experience and all of that. Yes, it, it does. And, yes, yes. I mean it's actually the model that was used in Great Britain when they attempted to fulfill the rights to medical care. I mean, the VA is, is sort of like a, uh, uh, a national health service, if you were to apply it to everyone. And- uh, Yes, yeah. I think, I think many veterans recognize it. You know, it can work. A government program can work yeah. and treat people properly. It has to be funded well. Well, it, uh, well yes, when I was in the Navy, um, I was very much impressed by the healthcare system because basically if there was something wrong with you, all you had to do was report to the dispensary and sit on the bench until somebody got to you and you would get healthcare. Yeah. I mean, given to you. Yeah, no bills. And that was very different from my experience and, and, uh, rural South Florida, I just, uh, you, yeah, it was just about, I, I guess, I don't really know how to put it. It, it was just the, the access to healthcare was not what it should have been in, yeah. in rural South Florida yeah. when, when we were there. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it, in fact, it was it was 180 degrees from being able to go to a dispensary and sit on the bench until you got out of there. Yeah. Um, it was 180 degrees from that. Uh, I really uh, feel that, yeah, the, the military health could could be used as a model for universal health care. Yeah. yeah. I, I really have long for a long time felt that. I mean, as it is now, I, I've heard, you know, at, particularly out campaigning in rural districts, I, I've spoken to many veterans who say, you know, it, it's uh, when you're out there, and this may have been true in Florida for you, you're not near veterans hospitals or there aren't that many veterans medical facilities nearby. So getting there, getting appointments is something of a difficulty. Um, and of course it doesn't oh, deal with all your family's needs. Yes. Well, no, no, if you're going to make it universal, why well, you would, yeah, sure. You would, you know, have, have dispensaries to report to, yeah. you know, clinics yeah. to, to yeah. report to. Yeah. Uh, the, the big problem with VA health care being, remote or being remote from it uh, yeah. is because there's, there's not enough of it. I mean, if, it, if yeah. everybody could go, yeah. I mean, there'd be of it where there'd be hospital clinics all across the country and it would be yeah. uh, a great boom industry yeah. for, uh, yeah. for us if we were to, to go to that. Yeah. I mean, because, because, uh, 
healthcare is an underserved market. There, there's a lot of potential for for growth there. A lot of potential for growth. Yeah. I'm asking you again to start your video, if you could. You know, it's interesting how, right. you know. I got it. Okay, you know, some of these programs you mentioned, like the GI Bill and Veterans Hospitals, you know, they've, they've <laughs> offered to, to veterans uh, opportunities that in many other countries are just taken for granted by everyone. For example, in almost every European country, higher education is completely free. There's no tuition to speak of. And in many, they even give you a stipend to cover your living costs. And that applies not just to people who've been in the military, it applies to everyone. And likewise with healthcare, you know, they're providing yes. healthcare to everyone. And some, as in Great Britain, you don't you don't pay for it at all. You know, it's paid through taxes, but you know, you you go to the hospital, it's like you going to the the commissary or whatever, or sitting on that bench and getting the services without having to to exchange any money. And yet you have a lot of people, I think, including people who are veterans yeah. who uh, who are suspicious of extending these things to everyone. Whereas I think the benefits are, are pretty obvious. Um, you know, they serve servicemen well and, and women. Um, they could be a model for all of us. You know, we can have all public universities have free tuition yes, they and stipends. And I think that would transform a lot of lives, forgive student debt, and also apply the same thing to technical schools for people, people who are not gonna go to college, but need some kind of training to make it. And, uh, you know, instead now- Or course, even- yeah. I was gonna say, or even, uh, I guess pre, technical school education. A lot of people don't make it through high school yeah, who could yeah. use GED. If they could, you know, have more opportunity yeah. uh, to work on that, it would. And it, it needs to come yeah. from the bottom on up. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think a lot of our, our kids, you know, we're tying their hands behind their back when they go through schools by, first of all, not getting rid of poverty wages for their parents or unemployment for their parents. You know, I mean, if they're fighting poverty or having to work two, three jobs, you know, that, that makes it more difficult for kids, obviously, to make it in school. If they're not getting decent health care or even decent nutrition, yeah. that's going to take its toll as it does. You know, and I think yes. under the pandemic, all of these things are, are, are increasing. And, uh, and then, as you know, the funding of schools, especially in rural areas, is, is, is very inequitable since it's still okay. based in large part on property values. And the property values out yeah. in a rural area are nothing like you know, what they're going to be in a rich suburb or a richer neighborhood. So the schools just have less resources to provide for students. And, uh, you know, all of that... Uh, takes its toll on every generation. And then of course, you don't have daycare or elder oh, care. You know, what do you do? And, and people yeah. are stranded, you know, they can't get around when they no longer can drive. You know, how do, how do you go yeah. when you're outside of the, the few cities that have decent public transportation? How do you get to a doctor? How do you get to see your relatives or friends or go to a church? Or anything like this, you know, it's uh, or, or shopping, even it's uh, it grows, you know, the isolation, yeah, is really it's, there, there is opportunity there, yeah. There's lots of opportunity there. There, there are many growth industries there that you're describing, yeah, they just have to be funded, yeah, and uh. I think in the end they will prove to be profitable. I think funding will come back yeah. through their successes. Yeah. We'll, we'll have a more uh, productive economy, far more productive economy. Well, if you were to try to dream of 
how a chicken industry could be run and operate in a just satisfactory way? How, how, how would you see it being reorganized? And what do you think the government can do to make it happen? Well, well, well the government, well, it's just about socialized now, only it's, instead of being socialized by our government, it's socialized by the very wealthy. I mean, they, uh, I, I, you know, just one way would just be to uh, replace the very wealthy with with the government, but uh, also there's another way that, that's conceivable, and that you could break up their monopoly and make it competitive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the you you could I, I, they're they're vertically integrated, and you could break off those those segments. You, yeah. Uh, growers could be, you know, their own. Corporation. To, another corporation would be the feed mill. Another one, the hatchery. Uh, another one, the packing plant. All these things could be uh, put on a competitive basis once again, yeah. Yeah. and, and uh, give people the opportunity to yeah. make a living from it. Yeah. 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 I mean, what's kind of uh, kind of striking about the situation you're describing is how, despite all the difficulties that people have trying to work as a contractor, growing chickens and, and handing them over to the monopoly agribusiness, people are still trying to get into it. I mean, you have this turnover that you're describing, yeah. you know, 11 years on average. But when people leave, someone else comes in. And uh, are they deluded? Well, are, they, well, are they being one sold? Born every minute, but yeah. Yes, yes. I, I was when I, when I went to invest money in a, in a chicken farm. I yeah. I researched it. I went out and I talked to growers, talked to the university, I talked yep. to the chicken companies and yeah. And uh, the way it all boiled down to before I signed anything and put put our money into it, my my wife had significant money she put into it. Yeah. Uh, I I saw it all boiled down to whether I trust the chicken company or not. Yeah. I decided to trust the chicken company. It's a mistake of my life. Mm. You, you can't trust corporate America. Yeah. They, they're not going to hold up their end. Yeah. They, they are, they, they just are not without, without yeah. regulation. And there's been yeah. decreasing regulation over the last 40 years. Yeah. But they get more and more exploited. Um, they need to be re-regulated. Yeah. And uh, perhaps with your social justice contract. I mean, they need to be, yeah. Yeah. society needs to be re-regulated to, to, uh, to tamp down uh, yeah. greed. Well, I think I think in a sense, as you can see, it's it's good. It it is actually good for business, certainly for the business of someone in your position, that we require business to do the right thing, whether they like it or not. And of course, competition yes, can drive right. them to, to fall to the lowest common denominator and sort of well, to try to seek to lower wages and well, costs and what they pay independent contractors as little as possible, cut corners and so forth, if they can cut their production costs. Well, costs and well it's all a race costs. to the bottom. I mean, it's far Race to the bottom, exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, that's what, what when I was a, a merchant seaman, uh, we were put out of business really by uh, flags of convenience. 
I mean, it just made the whole thing, the whole shipping industry, a, a one great big race to the bottom. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and, that, and that's happened in industry after industry after industry. They, yeah. They'll deregulate them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it'll get, it'll just be a race to the bottom. Well, I think, you know, as, as you're suggesting, the solution is uh, we citizens have to enact ground rules for business that requires it to yes. do the right thing, to treat consumers, contractors, employees as they should be, treat the environment as it should be. And There's products that are, are healthy. And, and treat. Yes, that's again. These some of our greatest successes it comes to regulation. Uh, the USDA and the FDA doing their regulating yeah. food and drugs is, has been a, a big, big success story yeah. in, in our country. Yeah. Uh, the people just aren't aware as to how that affects the quality of their food. Yeah. Uh, it is, and th there is a lot of value in, in, in regulations at times. Yeah. A lot of value. Yeah. Because it does, uh, it does provide a benefit, it provides profit. Sure. I mean, I don't think they have kids read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle anymore, you know, about what the packing industry and whole meat processing industry was like no. before regulations, before proper inspections and the like. But uh, that's where our current yeah. want to drive us by getting rid of as many regulations as they can and just set, set the quest for profit uh, on a pedestal. Completely unleash um, any humane um, limitations. Yeah. So. Yeah, and and they and they will uh, reach for inhumane uh, levels. That yeah, well, without you... regulation, it's. How do you feel about the prospects for the future? Well, we, we've got to make a sea change in our concept of government and business. Yeah. Uh, business is not basic and it is not an inherently good thing uh, as a lot of uh, marketing people would have you believe yeah. it, it's just and government is not inherently a bad thing as they would have you believe yeah. uh, government is inherently a good it, it's uh it i guess it, it lays down the ground rules to to keep things fair and equitable yeah. or it should yeah. we've done a lousy job of it especially in the last 40, 50 years. Yeah. Um, and, that, and if we have a, a, a sea change in, in government and in our concept of, of business, uh, yeah, there's hope for the future. Yeah. Uh, there's not much hope, for example. I mean, you're, you're I mean, I, that's, uh, I have a very pessimistic outlook for, you know, for my wife and me, for our children, for my grandson. I, I just, I, yeah. it's almost a despairing thing when I try to look into the, into their futures yeah. with, with the way things are now. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's not good. 
that's it's really bad and it shouldn't be. Yeah. Well, I think in, in the calamitous situation we're in, you know, which should be a perfect storm to wake people up more than ever before that we can't go about doing business as usual. <laughs> We've got to really turn a new corner. Uh, I'm hoping that some of yeah, that, some do. of that will we happen do. on November 3rd and that we'll begin, begin uh, turning in the right direction. And of course the people will have to push hopefully. us. Hopefully. Uh, but... Yeah, oh, I, yeah. I have my reservations, but, but yeah. uh, I, I think it'll be too, well, I'm concerned that it'll be too slow of yeah. a yeah. change. There needs well, to I be think, significant yeah. change. It needs yeah. to be yeah. quickly. Yeah. Well, th I want to, want to thank you for your support. I hope we can both contribute a little bit to making that change and making what happens uh, become, let's say, more, more substantial than it might otherwise if, if we're not vigilant. So thanks for coming to talk about these things today. And I, I wanna wish you- Oh, well, 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 thank you. Sir. Oh, well, thank you. We, uh... Yeah, and thank you for your efforts in these in these matters. Okay. Uh, I'm really impressed with with your thoughts, your your writing on on these things, and the way you've constructed uh, the policies, the various policies you have outlined. Uh, I, I think it's impressive. Well, well, thank you, and. Um... Till our next discussion. I wish you well and we should get together after November 3rd and, and see where we stand. So I hope so. Okay. I hope so. Okay, well, we'll take care. Well, I'm gonna good end night, this. Sir. Okay. T good night.